The focus of our Abstract Algebra 1 course will be the study of the mathematical structures of groups and rings. We'll begin with the study of groups and then follow with the study of rings. But before we begin our study of group theory, we first need to discuss some preliminaries. Many of these topics can be lumped into the category of elementary number theory and basic concepts about sets. So first of all, a set is simply a collection of objects called the elements of the set. And the notation we use is maybe lowercase letters for an element. A is a element of set A. Typically capital letters are used for sets. If A is a subset of B, this is the notation. A is a subset of B if every element of A is also an element of B. Uh, we have things like the intersection of two sets, the, the set of elements that are in both A and B, the union of sets A and B, with the elements that are in A or in B. Okay, The order or cardinality of a set the order of a set A denoted by A with absolute value bars around it. This is the size of the set, how many elements are in the set. Given two sets A and B, we can take the Cartesian product of the two sets. So the Cartesian product of sets A and B is the set defined by A times B. It's a set of ordered pairs where the first coordinates of these ordered pairs is in A. So the set of all ordered pairs A, B, such that A is in A and B is in set B. Some common sets of numbers that we'll, we'll see throughout various examples in abstract algebra. These common sets include the natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. The positive and negative natural numbers and the number zero make up the integers, which is denoted by a bold Z. When we take fractions of integers, we get uh, the rational numbers, bold Q, so this is the set of integers x such that x equals a over b uh, for a and b integers with b not equal to zero. So any number that can be written as a fraction of integers is by definition a rational number. Some real numbers are not rational, so if we combine the rationals and any irrational number, 
numbers that can't be written as fractions of integers, we get the set of real numbers, which we can kind of just explain as the set of all possible decimal expansions. So any real number has a decimal expansion. Okay, so instead of all decimal expansions, we'll call that the real numbers. Another important set, which is kind of an extension of the real numbers, is the complex numbers. So every complex number can be written in the form A plus B I, where A and B are real numbers, and I represents the square root of negative one. So we could also write this as I squared equals negative one. So the imaginary unit I so this makes up the set of complex numbers. And oftentimes it might be uh, advantageous to talk about positive integers or positive rationals or positive real numbers. So we have a, a notation, we use an exponent of a plus sign to denote just the positive elements of these common sets. So z plus q plus r plus denote the positive elements and the integers, the rationals, and the real numbers, uh, respectively. So you can think of the positive integers as just the set of natural numbers. So these symbols would be used interchangeably. Now given two sets A and B, we'll define a function or a map from A to B. Given sets A and B, a, a function or simply a map let's call it F from set A to set B is a subset of a cross B. So any subset of A cross B is by definition a relation, but a function is a specific subset of A cross B such that for every element of A, so for every little a in set A, there exists a unique element of B, little b in set B, such that the ordered pair a comma b is in this function f. So in other words, for every element of a, there's an ordered pair with that element a, and there's exactly one ordered pair with element a as the first coordinate. Some other notation, so if if the point, if the ordered pair a comma b is in the function f, we write f of a equals b. We can also talk about the function evaluated at a, a whole set. So the, the notation f of a set a, this sort of represents all of the elements B in set B such that B equals F of A for some element A in A.
This is often called the image of f, or the range of f. So these are all the possible second coordinates of every of the ordered pairs in um, the set F. Now given a subset of B, so for let's say C, which is a subset of B, we can define what we call the pre-image of C under F. So the notation is, it looks like F inverse of C but C is a set. So we want to define this set to be equal to the set of all elements in A that get mapped to um, elements of C. So we define this to be a set of all little a's in set A such that F of A is actually an element of set C. So this can be called the pre-image of C under F. Now let's talk about some special types of functions. A function from A to B is called one to one. Or injective. Or you could say the F is an injection. If For every elements A1 and A2 in the set A, F of A1 does not equal F of A2. So a function is one to one if the function takes distinct elements of A to distinct elements of B. function f from a to b is called onto or surjective if for every little b in set b there's an element little a in set a that gets mapped to little b so for every b in set b there exists an element A in set A such that F of A equals B. So another way of thinking it is that F of the set A will equal all of set B. Every element of B shows up as a second coordinate of an ordered pair. If a function is both one to one and onto, we say that F is bijective. So F is bijective, or F is a bijection if it is one to one and onto. Let's look at the definition of one to one again. We say that F is one to one if whenever A1 does not equal A2, then F of A1 does not equal F of A2. So a function is one to one if it takes distinct inputs to distinct outputs. But when we are showing that a particular function F is one to one in a proof, we typically use the contrapositive of this definition. 
So this would mean that if f of a1 equals f of a2, so if the outputs of the function are equal, then that implies that a1 equals a2. So this is a positive statement without any not equals to signs. So this is the definition that is more useful when actually proving that a function is one to one. So for example, if I want to prove that a function is one to one, I would begin by saying something like, suppose f of a1 equals f of a2, and then use the function definition and some algebra to show that a1 equals a2, and therefore we can conclude that f is one to one. So let's look at an example of a basic function just to demonstrate the technique of showing a function is one to one. So let's show that the function defined on the real numbers um, by f of x equals two x plus three is one to one. So I'll begin by assuming that two outputs are equal. So let's suppose f of a1 equals f of a2. Then using the definition of the function, we have that 2 times a1 plus 3 will equal 2 times a2 plus 3. And now we can use uh, basic algebra to show that a1 equals a2. In this equation, I can subtract 3 from both sides to obtain 2a1 equals 2a2. So to keep track of my steps, I'm subtracting 3 from both sides. And then to get a1 equal to a2, I can divide both sides by 2. And I can conclude that a1 equals a2. So I started by assuming that f of a1 equals f of a2. And I've shown that this implies that a1 equals a2. Therefore, f is 1 to 1. So this is the typical format for a one-to-one -one proof. And when we're dealing with functions defined over a general group, as we will see in abstract algebra, we can't often just use algebra tricks and basic algebra to show that the inputs are equal, but the format of the proof is the same. We start by saying let f of a1 equal f of a2, then we are finished when we have shown that a1 equals a2. So functions are a special case of a relation from a to b. Next we'll talk about a binary relation on a set a. So a relation or a binary relation on a non-empty set A it's a subset let's call it R of A cross A And we say, we write the notation A is related to B if the point AB is in this relation, capital R. Okay, so this notation is read uh, A is related to B. It's A with this um, tilde between the A and the B. Let's talk about 
special types of relations that we will come across. A relation is called an equivalence relation if it's reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Let's write that out. A relation. So let's define, let's call the relation just tilde on set A is called an equivalence relation. If it has these three conditions, first, for every element A in A, A is related to A. So this is called the reflexive property. Secondly, if A is related to B, then B is related to A. So we say the relation R is symmetric in this case. And then the third condition, A is trans, the relation R is transitive. So if A is related to B, B is related to C, then A is related to C. So a relation with all three characteristics is called an equivalence relation. An important idea that goes along with equivalence relations is the uh, is an equivalent class. So suppose you have an equivalence relation. Suppose this is an equivalence relation. on set A and suppose we have a an element of A then we define the equivalence class of little a is defined as the set of all elements of A that are equivalent to A. So the equivalent class of A is the set, and we'll denote this as um, A with square brackets around it. So this is called the equivalence class of, of A. It's a set of all elements of set A that are equivalent to A. Note that every equivalence class is a non-empty set because the element little a is in the equivalence class of A. So every equivalence class is non-empty since A is an element of the equivalence class of A. Let's look at an example of an equivalence relation on the real plane. So let our set A be the real plane, R2, and let's define the relation tilde on the real plane, on R2, by the following. So the point in the real plane x1, y1 
will be related to the point x2, y2 if x1 squared plus y1 squared is equal to x2 squared plus y2 squared. So it can be shown that this is an equivalence relation. But let's consider um, an equivalence class. Let's look at an equivalence class of the point 0, 1. So take an, N, an element of the real plane, the point 0, 1. So 0, 1 is a point in the plane. The equivalence class of 0, 1 would be the set of all points in the real plane that are equivalent to 0, 1 under this relation. So formally, this is the set of all points x, y in the real plane, R2, such that x, y is equivalent to 0, 1. So what does it mean to be equivalent to 0, 1? Well, this would be the set of all points in the real plane, set of all points x, y in the real plane, such that x squared plus y squared equals 0 squared plus 1 squared, so that equals 1. And you might recognize this as being the unit circle in the uh, real plane. So the circle centered at the origin with radius 1. So in fact, the equivalent classes of any point are actually circles centered at the origin. So this unit circle has radius 1 and is centered at the origin. So all equivalence classes are circles with centered at the origin. Next, we'll define a partition of a non-empty set A, and we'll see that a partition is connected with the notion of equivalence relations on A. So a partition of a non-empty set A It's a collection of non-empty subsets of A and I'll write this as a set of these subsets Let's call it a, the subsets A sub i, where i is, is some indexing set. So where capital I is some indexing set. So we have a, a, a collection of non-empty subsets of A. such that A equals the union of all of these subsets AI. And further, there is no element in common with any, any two of these subsets. So in other words, each of the subsets is disjoint. 
So the intersection of AI and AJ is the empty set if I does not equal J. So partition of a non-empty set A is a collection of non-empty subsets of A such that A is the disjoint union of these subsets. So A is a disjoint union of these subsets. Okay. Next, we will look at a theorem that shows that the notions of equivalence relations on set A and partitions of set A are actually the same. So let A be a non-empty set. And suppose we have an equivalence relation on A. Then we'll prove that the distinct equivalence classes of this relation form a partition of A. Conversely, if we have a partition of A, then there actually exists a an equivalence relation on a with the a subsets ai as equivalence classes So this theorem basically states that the, the notions of equivalence relations on A and partitions of A are equivalent. So let's begin the proof of this theorem. Since little a is an element of its own equivalence class, for every A in set A, we see that we can actually write A as the union of equivalence classes of elements of A. But we need to show that A can actually be written as a disjoint union of these equivalence classes to get a partition of A. 
So let's suppose that there are two equivalent classes that are not disjoint. Suppose the equivalence class of A intersect the equivalence class of B is non-empty. Then that means that there's an element of A let's call it C. So there's an element C in, in set A such that C is an element of the intersection of the equivalence class of A and B. So therefore C is related to A and C is related to B. Now let X be an element of the equivalent class of A. Then X is related to A. And since this is an equivalence relation and C is related to A, we know that A is related to C. And we have that C is related to B. Therefore, by the transitivity property of this equivalence relation, we see that X must therefore be related to B. And X must be in equivalence class of B. So we've shown that an arbitrary element X of the equivalence class of A is also an element of the equivalence class of B. Therefore, we've shown that the equivalence class of A is a subset of the equivalence class of B. But we could similarly show that the equivalence class for B is a subset of the equivalence class for A. So these equivalence classes are actually equal. Therefore, if we have distinct equivalence classes of this relation, they are disjoint. So by taking the union of distinct equivalence classes, we can partition the set A. Now suppose we're given a partition of A. Let's define an equivalence relation on A. So we're going to define the relation tilde on A by A is related to B if there is 
an I in the indexing set I such that A and B are both in the subset AI. So we're given a partition of subsets and every pair of elements is related to each other. So A is related to B if A and B are both elements of the subset AI for some AI. Now we need to show that this relation is actually an equivalence relation. We need to show that this relation is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Well, let, let A be in set A. We need to show that A is related to A. So since A is the union, the disjoint union of the subsets AI, little a has to be an element of some AI. Then A and A are both elements of this AI and therefore A is related to A. So this relation is reflexive. Now let's talk about the symmetric property. So suppose A is related to B. we need to show that B is related to A. So by definition, we know that A and B are both elements of AI for some I. But if A and B are in AI, then B and A are both in AI. And that's the definition of B being related to A. So we see that this relation is symmetric. Finally, let's look at transitivity. Suppose A is related to B and B is related to C. we need to show that A is related to C. Well, since A is related to B, we know that A and B are both in some subset AI. And since B is related to C, we know that B and C are both in some subset AJ. But remember that since we have a partition, the distinct subsets AI are, are disjoint. But notice that B is in the intersection of AI and AJ. So if AI and AJ are distinct subsets, then this is impossible. So therefore, AI must actually equal AJ. So we see that the intersection of AI and AJ is non-empty. The only way this is possible 
as if these are the same subsets. So thus, I equals J. Then A and C are both in AI, and we see that A is therefore related to C. So this is an equivalence relation. So suppose you have uh, an element of one of these subsets AI. So if A is an element of the subset AI, since the AIs are all disjoint, the little a can't be in any other partitioning subset. So then A is not an element of AJ for all J not equal to I. Further, we see that the equivalence class of A, by definition, is a set of all elements of A, let's say all B, such that B is related to A. But by definition of being related, this is the set of all B and A, such that B and A are in some subset AJ, but A can only be in the subset AI. So this would be the set of B and A, such that B and A are in AI. But we already know that, that A is in uh, subset AI, so this is really equivalent to the set of B in set A, such that B is in AI, and that's just the definition of the set AI. So this concludes the proof of this theorem. We've seen that given an equivalence relation on A, we see that the, the distinct equivalence classes partition A. Further, if we're given a partition of A, we can define an equivalence relation on A with equivalence classes equal to the partitioning subsets.